Hi there. Um, welcome to another Facebook or YouTube live video. Um, and so um, today I wanted to talk about developing a language with which to communicate with the other side. And let me explain before I get into it. So um, as many of you know, that I crossed over to the other side because I had end stage cancer and I literally, I died and I crossed over. The doctors basically said that my, my body was, was done because the cancer had completely ravaged my body. But when I was on the other side, when my soul, when my spirit left my body, um, I felt amazing. My spirit, I felt alive, I felt free. I felt incredible and I could, I was actually aware of my physical body lying there on the hospital bed and it's, and it looked so small and insignificant compared to how I was now feeling because I was free and liberated and I was this spirit and I was magnificent and expanded and I felt powerful and I was surrounded by loved ones. But the only thing was that I was aware that my family were distraught. They were all around my body and they were distraught. And um, my mother was crying and I could see all that happening. I was aware of all that. And time is not linear on the other side. It doesn't exist. So even though I knew that in the blink of an eye, uh, which is what it feels on the other side, I knew my family would be joining me after they crossed over, I still um, know that I wanted to let them know that I was fine. They didn't have to cry for me. I wanted to let them know, but I couldn't communicate with them because we don't have vocal cords. We don't have a body. We don't have any biology. And so, um, and, and so there was no way for me to let them know. And I just had to trust that they would find out sooner or later that I was OK. <clears throat> so. I realized, though, after coming back, that if I was there longer, like in other words, if I had stayed there, if I was actually, if I stayed dead and never came back, I would have probably started to figure out ways to communicate with my loved ones on this side, to let them know that I'm OK, or, or to guide them whenever I could, <clears throat> to give them signals and signs and things like that, and to let them know I was watching over them. So I would have developed. Um, some way of communicating with them and the and I would have to choose ways in which they would understand so I would have to choose things which had meaning to them and somehow draw their attention to it and some of the things which um, I know that spirit uh, is able to tamper with sometimes is electronics but here's the other thing is that you can actually communicate when you're a soul, when you're a spirit, when you're on the other side. You can communicate with your loved ones telepathically, but they don't realize that it's you. So if I'm the soul, if I'm the dead person and I'm trying to communicate with you, I may be able to telepathically say things to you, but you won't realize it's me. You will think, oh, I'm just thinking of Anita right now. Oh, this is what. Um, or oh, this thought came into my head, or this thought, you won't always realize that who it is that's putting the thought in your head. So, um, so this is why, like if you have loved ones on the other side, this is why I wanted to create this video to encourage you to create a language to make it easier for them to communicate with you. And I want to give you some examples, and I want to give you some examples of how Wayne Dyer has communicated with me after he's passed. And uh, that's why I wanted to explain to you what it felt like when I was on the other side. Because we're not physical and it's really hard to actually um, communicate in a way that the people would know that it's you who's communicating. Um, so what happened with me after Wayne Dyer passed away was super interesting. There were so many incidences and I will give you a couple of examples. Um, literally very, very shortly after he passed away, I was speaking at a conference. Um, and, and this conference was a near-death experience conference where most of the people in the audience 
had never heard of Wayne Dyer. And for those of you who don't know, Wayne Dyer was a, um, was a multi uh, New York Times best-selling author who discovered my story on the internet. And he's the one that encouraged me to, um, to write my book and, and he got it published through Hay House. And so he launched me on this, uh, on this trajectory that I've been on. So he passed away in 2015. And it was a shock when he passed away. We didn't expect it. It was very, very sudden. Um, and literally just a very short time after he passed away, I was speaking at a conference which had been scheduled for months, as most of them are. And it was um, a near-death experience conference where most of the people in the audience, they didn't know that Wayne Dyer had passed away. They weren't aware of it. Um, and so I was speaking. Uh, sharing about my near-death experience. Now, bear in mind, up until that point, um, I had always been on tour with Wayne Dyer, and and I would share my story with an audience, which was his audience. He would bring me up on stage, and I would share my story. And he would be there prompting me. He was like my mentor, and he would be on stage with me, prompting me and telling me uh, and, and asking me the questions. And so I would then share with the audience, I would answer his question, but be sharing with the audience um, using his questions as a prompt. So anyway, here I was just a couple of weeks after he passed away on stage. Um, I believe I was in Virginia or somewhere, and, uh, and I was speaking at a near-death experience conference. And then at the end of the conference, um, as I was leaving, somebody came up to me and said, there's a lady who really wants to talk to you. Do you have a few minutes to speak with her? And I said, yes, I, I, uh, yes, I do. So I went to see this lady, and this lady said to me, she was sitting in the audience, and she is a psychic, and she sees spirit. Now, with me, I hear them and I feel them. But she actually said, I see spirit. And she said, there is a man on the other side um, who, who is, you know, who's passed on, who was standing right behind you with his hand on your shoulder, and he was, he was giving you prompts as to what to say next. And I was like, what, really? So in that moment, I for some reason thought it must be, a, I didn't think of Wayne right away, interestingly. I thought if there's a man watching over me, could it be my dad? You know. So I said, it, could it have been my dad? And he said, and she said that, um, no, it was somebody Caucasian. He was not Indian. He was Caucasian. He was a white man, and, but he, and he was bald. Was your dad bald? And I said, no, my dad wasn't bald, but it was Wayne Dyer. That's what I said. It was Wayne Dyer. And she said, but Wayne Dyer is still alive. And I said, no, he passed away. And she said, oh, my God, yes, that's who it was, because she had no idea that Wayne Dyer had passed away. So I didn't even realize that he was prompting me, but he was doing it telepathically. And I thought that I was the one who was knowing what to say next and what to say next. But he was giving me the prompts, like, OK, now talk about this. Now tell the audience about this. So, um, so this is the kind of thing that they do, but we don't realize it. So even when you don't feel or know that you're being guided, Please know that you are. Now, when I say developing a language, uh, let me give you some examples of what I mean. Um, when One of the things I remember most is that when Wayne Dyer was alive, he used to love to show this video at his events. Uh, and it was a video, it was a clip of him speaking about monarch butterflies and how when somebody crossed over, this monarch butterfly came and landed on him, and how he was sure it was this person who had crossed over. And he would show this video like over and over quite a few times. I've seen it so many times. And so in my head, even while he was still alive, I had always associated monarch butterflies with Wayne Dyer. And the big reason is because I had never heard or never used the term monarch butterflies, never knew those big butterflies were called monarchs until I had seen Wayne Dyer's video, which I would see over and over. The other thing is, living in Hong Kong, I'd seen regular butterflies. I had never seen a monarch butterfly. 
after Wayne Dyer passed, I started seeing monarch butterflies. And to this day, I see monarch butterflies all the time. And I know that is a sign from Wayne. And very often, I ask for it. I say, I actually say, if I'm having a bad day or something, I'll say, Wayne, show me a sign. Send me a monarch butterfly. And sure enough, there'll be a monarch butterfly. And that's what I mean about assigning signs to them, because then you're giving them something to work with. And there's lots of things you can assign them, numbers, times of day. You know, I will actually say, prompt me at 1111 or 111. And, uh, and sure enough, um, I will, something will prompt me to look at the time, and it'll be 1111 or 111. And I'll go, thank you, Wayne. Um, I, then I know, and you'll know that they're still there when that happens. Like, people often say that, why is it that whenever I look at the clock, it's uh, 444 or whatever number has meaning for them? What you're not realizing is that somebody from the other side is prompting you, and you don't realize they're doing it. They're prompting you, and they're saying, look at the clock. And you're just thinking that's your own thought. What's the time? So that's kind of how they do it. Um, so many other things have happened to me that uh, I'll give you another example. Is when um, I was uh, speaking at his memorial, again, not long after he passed away, huge event in Orlando. And I was um, about to go on stage in 10 minutes to give a eulogy. There were other speakers also giving eulogies, and I was one of a bunch of speakers. But I was so nervous. It's like, what do you say about such an incredible man? Um, and so I was really nervous, and I was like, oh my god, OK, I need to go to the restroom for a minute before I get on stage. And so I asked somebody backstage, I said, which way is the restroom? Because I was standing backstage waiting to go on. And I said, which way is the closest restroom? And he said, oh, you go out here, this backstage door, and go down the corridor, and you can't miss it. You know, He gave me some directions, and he said, you can't miss it. I went, as I was walking, and I was thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And I must have missed the turning that he told me about, because I kept going, and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't see it. And I turned down another uh, corridor, and I couldn't see the restroom. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm lost. So I kept walking around, and then I saw this door with a sign on it that said, just be yourself. And I thought, oh, you wanted me to see this sign, didn't you, to calm me down? Just be yourself. I thought, OK, I can do that. So I knew when I go on stage to just be myself. After I saw that sign, and I walked a little bit further, and there was the restroom. Now, had I come the correct way, I would not have seen that sign. So these, you know, so this is another one of many. There was yet another one, which is a little bit of a longer story, was that Wayne had always wanted me to speak at the Mile High Church in Denver, Colorado. And he had told the people there to invite me. And he told me, when they invite me, say yes. you got to go speak there. And he had spoken there like maybe every year or twice a year. Um, for years, like for the last 12 years, he'd spoken there. He was really good friends with the people there. And so he said that I've shared your story with them. They love you. So say yes when they ask me. Surely, so sure enough, they invited me to speak. And I said yes. And I'd agreed to speak. Um, these things are booked, as I said, months out. So I'd agreed to speak for February 2016. And this, and, uh, and the time I had uh, um, agreed was like a year beforehand. It must have been like February or March in 2015. I got booked for 2016. So little did I know that Wayne was not going to be alive by the time that date came around. So in, in August of uh, 2015, he passed away, which, as I said, was a shock. And so in February 2016, I flew to Denver. And the lady, um, and a wonderful lady from Mile High Church, picked me up at the airport. And we started talking. And she said, oh, you know, I used to pick Wayne up every time he would arrive. And I really miss him. And I said, yeah, tell me about it. I really miss him, too. And then um, and Danny was with me. And then she dropped us off at the hotel. She said, this is the hotel we book for Wayne every time. Um, so she dropped us off at the hotel. We go to the front desk. They give us our key. I go up to the room. 
And when I got to the room, um, it, it, the interesting thing was the room was a mess. It was like somebody had left and the cleaners or the housekeepers had forgotten to clean it. So the towels were strewn in the bathroom. The bed was unmade, you know, so it was like a room that hadn't been cleaned up. So I made a quick call downstairs to the front desk and I said, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I think this room hasn't been clean, cleaned up. So it was a gentleman that answered the phone and he said, oh, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm coming up right away. He came upstairs and he looked at the room and he said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm so embarrassed, I don't know how this happened. He said, um, please, the both of you go, go down to our cafe and have a coffee and a sandwich on us while we either clean up this room or, or, or um, find another room for you. So I said, sure. So we were sitting in the cafe, and while we're having our coffee and sandwich, uh, a lady in a business suit came up to us, and she said, I'm the, um, uh, I'm the floor manager or the hotel manager or something. And she said, I just heard about what happened, and I just wanted to apologize. I don't know how it happened, because on the roster, it's ticked off as having been cleaned. So I don't know how that fell through the cracks. But I would like to upgrade you to a suite. And I was like, wow, that, um, that's, I thought that's really wonderful. Um, I'm so glad that happened. So she said, we're going to give you our special suite, which is on the top floor on the corner where you get a full view of the city. So I said, oh my god, that's really amazing. Thank you so much. I was so thrilled. So we go up to our suite, and we're like stretching out. And it's nice. It's really big. It has like a living room and a bedroom. And it's a corner suite with. Um, you know, with the floor to ceiling window glass and we have the view of the, of the city. And so we had a wonderful night at uh, just, you know, enjoying our room and enjoying the hotel. The next morning when the lady uh, from Mile High Church came to pick me up to take us to the event, she said, how was your evening? And then I told her what happened. And, and I said, it was the corner suite on the 12th floor. And I was like so thrilled. And, and I said to her, I said, I think Wayne must have messed up that room because they said on the roster it showed it was, it was made. I think he must have done that just to give me a good experience because he wanted me, because he really wanted me to do this event. And her jaw dropped when she heard which room. She goes, Definitely it was Wayne because that room you got was the very room he would insist on booking every time he came here. That was his room. And I was like, oh my God, goosebumps. So these are some of the examples of signs that our loved ones on the other side send us. And we can make it easier for them by assigning certain things like numbers or, you know, as I said, butterflies or hummingbirds or deer or things like that, elephants. I mentioned before another sign for Wayne for me is elephants because he used to always share the story about being a scurvy elephant. Those of you that know him will know what I mean. Um, when he was a child, his teacher once referred to him as a disturbing, a disturbing element in the classroom. And he went home and said to his parents, and he asked his parents, what's a scurvy elephant? Because that's what he heard. So when his parents went and checked with their teacher, they found out she meant disturbing element. So anyway, so um, that's why an elephant is another sign, which keeps popping up in the most unlikely places, not real live elephants, but pictures of elephants. There was once a photograph of when I was in Seattle um, where Milena, uh, who, you, who was my social media manager, she was traveling with me and she took a photo of me standing in front of a wall um, somewhere near Pike's Place Market. It was a wall where we noticed, she noticed a light bulb that said, be the light. So she said, stand in front of that light bulb and I'll take a photo of you. When she took the photo and then we looked at the photo, she realized that what we hadn't seen was right above the light bulb was a big pink elephant. But because it was not at eye level, we hadn't even noticed it. 
but on the photo, it was clear and plain. So it was a big pink elephant, and then the, and under the elephant was this bulb that said, be the light. So it felt like it was a sign from Wayne saying, be the light. So I have had so many signs like that, and I just wanted to let you know that your loved ones from the other side never leave you. They're with you. They communicate with you. They want you to know that they are fine. They want you to be happy. Um, they don't want you to feel guilty if you find joy and if you laugh again. They don't want you to feel guilty if you find love again, if you've lost a partner. All they want is for you to be happy, and that's what they'll be trying to communicate with you all the time. And many of them will even help you, guide you, drop thoughts in your head to help you be happy. Um, have we got any questions, Abby? So I just wanted to uh, uh, actually also give a shout out to any sanctuary members I have that might be tuned in. Uh, so thank you all for being a part of my sanctuary. I'm going to have to get off soon only because I have, uh, I'm super excited about an event that I'm doing inside the sanctuary in a very short time. And um, it's, it's going to be with Donna Eden, the, the energy healer, and she is absolutely amazing. So um, if you want to know about my sanctuary, please check it out at uh, www.anitamurjanisanctuary.com. Um, it's a membership platform where we talk about all things like this, all things esoteric, all things energy, um, and, uh, and we teach stuff and we learn stuff. And uh, yeah, it's just a safe place to communicate with like-minded people. And if we have... So my thoughts on reincarnation is that, uh, is that time is not linear. So even though you get reincarnated multiple times, you are also able to be here. I know this sounds confusing. I actually spoke about, wrote about it in my book, Dying to Be Me. But when you cross over to the other side, you can actually see all your lives simultaneously, but you know that in terms of the way that we look at time here, um, you know that this time was a historic time. This, like you could say, okay, this was in the 17th century. This one was in the 19th century. And you can, but when, but from the perspective of being outside of your body, you can actually view any of these lives and each life can be, uh, is as clear, you know, they, they, you can view them at any time and you don't have to view them sequentially. Um, it's kind of like if you think of an apartment building uh, and an apartment building, let's say, has seven stories, you, your soul can only be in one at a time. So my, my, I physically can only be in one of those in, on level one or level two or level three or, or level seven. I can only choose one floor to be on at any given time. But all seven floors exist simultaneously. When I'm outside the building, so when you're outside of your body, you can see and say, oh my God, I've lived seven lives or 7,000 lives or whatever it is. Oh, let me see what happened in this life, what happened in this life. But when you're in the physical life, you can only be in one at a time. You can only experience one at a time. When you're in your physical body, you can only experience one at a time. But the, your deceased loved ones and yourself, there is a part of you that is also outside of your body. So sometimes, and this gets complicated and is, calls for a whole other video, there are moments where I actually feel that this, and this is what I mean about my higher self. There, whenever I s refer to my higher self, it is the infinite part of me that is outside of my body that can see the entire apartment building, that can see the spectrum of all my lives. That's what I mean whenever I refer to my higher self. That is always there, even when I am in within a life. And it's the same for your deceased loved ones and your living loved ones. So thank you for that question. 
And um, yeah, and thank you so much. And um, I will see you all soon. And if you're a sanctuary member, I will see you inside. If you're not, that's fine too. I'll see you in my next video. Thank you so much and, uh, and have a great weekend. Bye.